Well, I'd like to thank you all for um, coming. I know I'm kind of a, a, a late person on the docket, as they only asked me yesterday if I would uh, give this, uh, give a talk, and uh, I happen to have something in my, I happen to have this talk in my back pocket, so, and I made a mad dash to update the slides this afternoon. <laughs> um, as uh, there's some more interesting things I wanted to talk about uh, in this talk, and this is obviously hardware is hard, a software perspective on uh, building hardware, um, which, let's go ahead and start with a survey. I know there's not a whole lot of you in here, but I want to ask some quick questions, see what everybody, or kind of get an idea of where everybody's at. I'm hoping that everybody in this room actually builds software, right? Is there anybody who doesn't build software? Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> I'll keep my eye on you. How many of you build hardware? Okay. So you didn't raise your hand to either of those. <laughs> okay. Who's, uh, who in this room has ever actually, you, you guys have Kickstarter over here, right? How many of you, or, or, you know, something like Kickstarter, how many of you have backed something on Kickstarter? So, there, so you, 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 you can answer the next question easily. How many of you have actually gotten the thing you backed on Kickstarter? <laughs> You know, how many of you have uh, backed something on Kickstarter and then it's been delayed indefinitely, like for the next 10 million years? And they keep telling you it's coming, it's coming. Okay, so, you know, about half the people, or actually a bit more than half the people who have actually backed something. And how many of you have backed something and it's just never shown up? And they've gone bankrupt and they've stolen all your money and you've cried and been very sad? Okay. And the simplest question I can ask, how many of you, since you're all building software, and you know, think that hardware is really, really easy and that it should be right 100% of the time and it's never broken? Hardware, I mean, come on, it's never broken, right? <laughs> oh, okay, so our, our, our naysayer is actually a... Uh... Okay, so that, that gives me a pretty good idea of where you guys are at. And I'll, I'll give you some background. I'm a software guy at the end of the day. I, I've a uh, lot of IT systems, uh, architecture, that kind of stuff. I'm not normally a hardware guy, but a number, of year, or a number of years ago, I just started building things. Robots and this and that, and as time has progressed, I've actually gotten uh, more and more low-level and more and more hardware-centric. And by software, you know, by, by building software, you know, storage things and whatnot, what I really mean is that I write a lot of bugs that since they're software, I can fix later. Maybe. Sort of. Because, you know, we, we, we all write software. We all know that we want to go back and fix all these bugs and things, but there's the cool new feature I want to work on. <laughs> Not necessarily these, you know, these old bugs that nobody ever sees. But one of the really neat things about software <laughs> is that when things break, I can fix them. And the compilation time, even for, or even to fix any of these bugs, you know, is relatively small. And I, and I use relatively small in a cosmic scale, not in a, you're staring at your computer and all you want it to do is compile this thing faster because you want to fix this. I mean, what, what's the longest thing anybody in here has compiled? Or anything that you normally compile takes? You know, five minutes, an hour? Anybody longer than an hour for your typical project? Are you building an entire distro? Five. Oh, five hours? That's a pretty big. That's a, actually a pretty big build. What are you building? Out of curiosity. Oh, Gen. Oh. <laughs> so you're using Gen two, and it only took you five hours, and depleted the ozone layer, and caused global warming. Okay. <laughs> so anybody longer than five hours for a typical compile? So five hours is, you know, I agree, that's actually pretty long, although you, you're building an entire distro. That's not, in the grand scheme of things, that's not too bad. Well, hardware is a little bit different. Hardware, the compilation time, if you just look at this from a pure, you know, how long it takes to get from you've started something to you have something physically in your hand, is a little bit longer. I'll give you a, a, a really rough idea of how long this takes. And this, is, this graph is in seconds. 
<laughs> because the, the, the Linux kernel, which is uh, what's up there on your left, um, doesn't take that long to compile, even on a really, really slow machine these days. On the flip side, the time it takes to compile a, a chunk of hardware is a really, really long time. And you know, most software folks think about the compilation time or the, de de the design time of a chunk of hardware as just the time it takes to lay it out, you know, uh, do the schematic, lay it out, and you know, see what's going to be there for the board. However, that doesn't take into, the, uh, into account the physical properties of taking your digital uh, assets and converting them into a real physical thing that you can actually start testing your software on. And to give you an idea, so um, I work on uh, an open source hardware project called the Minnow Board. It's a, uh, an Atom x86 based uh, system. What I'm going to show you right now are the actual physical layers of the PCB that the board is built from. And I'm going to try and point out a few things to try and really hit home exactly how complicated this board is. And there's a whole lot of layers. They're all stacked three-dimensionally. And in some cases, uh, this is layer one, actually. Um, in some cases, some of the traces that have to go from the SOC itself to other points on the board have to be absolutely exactly the same. The margin of difference is you know, measured in atoms in some cases. And specifically, if you look kind of to the, the right of the board, just underneath the thing that looks like a big giant square, I wish I could actually just like point, because it, it really doesn't make any sense. There's a bunch of little squiggle lines. Those squiggle lines are the traces from the main CPU, uh, the SOC, to um, main memory. So DDR3 uh, memory in this case. And those traces specifically have to be exactly the same length, all of them. And there's a lot of traces. And there's, a lot, uh, and there's four different chips that span, um, that are, uh, two of them are on the bottom and two of them are on the top. And all of those traces from the SOC to those four chips all have to be exactly the same length in three dimensions. So we're, I, I'm starting to, you know, get into exactly how complicated this is. We'll move on. Layer two is kind of boring. Three, again, see a lot more of those squ uh, squiggle uh, traces up there. Layer four, again, pretty boring. Uh, the boring layers have a tendency to be ground plane so that um, you can uh, route uh, ground signal back and act as a buffer uh, uh, for uh, RF. Five, pretty boring, although you still get a bunch of the, the squiggle traces. Until we finally get to the top of the board. So this is a 10 layer board, which um, means that there's uh, 10 physical layers, including the top and the bottom, and eight inner trace, or inner trace layers to this board. This is, um, and the board itself is about yay big. So there's a lot going on here. There's a lot that uh, uh, goes on in hardware manufacturing. And typically the way that uh, a board works is the smaller it gets, the, um, the more layers for a complicated design. The bigger it gets, the fewer layers you need because you can spread everything out. So, that, um, so the minnow board, since it's about yay big, uh, we've had to stack, a, stack it up to about 10 layers just to fit out all of the routing on, onto the board, which you can kind of see here. And let's just stack them all up on top of each other as if this was a real PCB. Frankly, it's kind of boring after you get the, the, the ground plane layers in between everything. And that's, this is a full x86 computer uh, from a, a design perspective. And it's, you know, in, in, in the grand scheme of things, it's actually probably one of the most complicated boards that you can actually get and play with and still have it be open hardware. Um, you know, things that get substantially bigger, you know, you're talking, you're talking real PC motherboards at that point. Um, and they're not, the complexity of the board actually doesn't really change dramatically. The, the main components that are really hard to route, PC, uh, um, you know, the, the, the main memory, as well as all of the power that has to get drawn by the major uh, SOC. But while this is really, really complicated, let's talk about something a little bit different. 
or a little bit simpler. This is a, a board I recently did uh, uh, for a project. Uh, really, really simple, but it was uh, needed to be done on a really uh, tight deadline. And it's basically a, a, just a simple soldering kit. The that's the entire schematic for that board. <laughs> when I say simple, I really mean simple. <laughs> Uh, for those of you who are not used to seeing schematic designs, uh, the thing on the far left is a battery, R1 is a resistor, and obviously LED1 is an LED. That's all there is to this board. This is probably one of the simplest things that one could actually build, and I'm, I'm going to go back and just, the LED, ah, silly software. So the LED sits in the center, there's a, a, a battery, and then the resistor you can kind of see there on the right. Um, from the schematic view, but to, you know, so I, I showed you what it, you know how long it actually takes to build something in comparison to the Linux kernel to some software. Well, let's actually put some numbers to that, um, some real numbers. These are numbers I actually physically pulled earlier today uh, for that exact board. So it's a, roughly a three inch by three inch board, although it's cut into a, a, a circular shape. Um, most uh, board manufacturing houses actually charge you by the square uh, sky size, not by the physical, the actual physical size, because that's just the way it has to come out of the system. Um, so the fastest that that board can actually get made in a qu in quantity 150 pieces, which is a fairly small run uh, for most board houses, is three days. At which point each board costs. $13.63 per PCB, or about $14,000, to get that 150 three-inch disks of um, some copper and a bunch of uh, fiberglass made and actually it, uh, and being shipped. This does not include actually getting it into your hands. That's just how many days it takes to make it. However, if you let time kind of go out a little bit further, you know, the price drops uh, precipitously. And this is kind of what happens in the real-world manufacturing situation. You know, so from a, a software perspective, we, we expect once we're done with something, once we've, you know, said, great, it compiles, it passes all of the tests, we can ship it today. And we throw it up on GitHub, and an hour later, we've made a tarball, and we've made it available, and we've written an email and sent out the announcement. Well, with hardware, you know, even you know, once you've got all of your design files done out there, ready, and you've shipped them off to a manufacturer, this is what they'll quote you for how much it's going to cost you and how long they believe it's going to take them. However, this does not always mean that this is how long it takes. This is just how long it takes once they've decided everything's right. And because of a whole slew of problems. I'm going to kind of run into these. Uh, um, nothing ever works the way you expect it in the world of hardware. To give you an idea of why this is such a mess, the, the tools that are used to design hardware were almost all universally written either in the early 90s or some, sometime in the 90s, which means that the UIs haven't been updated uh, since then. They're really kind of a pain in the butt to use. So if you've ever tried playing with Blender even. Blender is actually a better user interface experience than most CAD tools. <laughs> and if you've ever played with Blender, the 3D modeling software, it's a pain in the butt to use. It's really complicated and the learning curve, if you saw Leslie Hawthorne's um, uh, keynote earlier today, it's kind of like Emacs on the text editor. <laughs> it kind of goes up and then twirls and then just sits there. Well, CAD software is almost the same way because there are so many um, knobs and dials that you can turn to create a, a PCB that they've ha they kind of don't have much choice. The, you know, everything's going to be complicated, everything's going to be hard. So you've got that problem. And in, in, even just trying to, to, to define how many layers your PCB has ends up in a very, very complicated uh, uh, definition. Because while, you know, a two-layer PCB, uh, when you create a via, which is a, 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 a trace that goes from one side of the board to the other, it's really simple. There's nowhere for it to stop. It just goes straight through on a two-layer board. 
What happens when you have a four-layer board? Well, a four-layer board gets way more complicated to make because what they actually do um, for most of the time is create two two-layer boards, glue them together, and then deal with the vias uh, um, uh, between uh, the four layers. Now, in the simplest case, they just take the via and they throw it all the way through all four layers. However, des uh, designers can get clever. And since these are physically two different PCBs, you can actually have what's called blind or buried vias. So, what this means is that in the blind case, you have a via that runs only two layers on one side or the other. And when they're glued together, those vias are not supposed to actually touch. Except that if you do your definition wrong, they do. <laughs> At which point you've now shorted the board and you've just wasted however many dollars building a board and time, which I've just shown you can actually be a fair amount of time to get things done cheaply, or a lot of money to get them done quickly, to do even simple things. And this is, again, a three inch by three inch board that's two, uh, two PCB layers, which is just about the simplest thing you could do. Now, with a two layer board, you don't have to worry about things like blind and buried vias, but on a more complicated design for whatever reason, this could be a, a, an issue. When you get up to something like the middle board, which I was just showing you the really, you know, the 10 layers, blind and buried vias get really, really complicated really, really fast, and people don't like to use them. Or, well, it, Designers like to use them. Fab houses don't like to do them. Slightly different. Um, so that you know, so you've got problems with the software being really, really kind of old and crappy and hard to use. The learning curve is ridiculous. Trying to define things correctly is really, really hard. The documentation sucks. Actually, I, I'm apparently just re-giving Leslie's talk from earlier. <laughs> Except I'm talking about CAD. Um, and even, even if you do everything right and you send it off to the manufacturer, and in fact on the, uh, this, this three inch by three inch design I did, they emailed me back immediately and said, your, uh, your Gerbers, which are the, uh, if you're familiar with 3D printing, Gerbers are kind of like the G-code output. It's what they're actually going to build the, uh, the board from. They're like, it's all broken, it's a disaster, and they were, what they were complaining about, let me back up here and I'll see if I can kind of show you, is the, um, if you look at the battery holder, uh, which is down there at the bottom, you'll see a circle with, uh, with a couple of lines on, on either side. What this actually ends up looking like on the PCB is a circle with a circle on the inside of it. So, ooh, I have markers. <laughs> so you end up with something like this uh, as it's actually exposed on the board. And they were freaking out over this particular design for a battery holder because they had never seen it before. Which, lend, which leads you to a very interesting conclusion. Every time you send a board off to a board manufacturer, there is a physical person on the other side who has to not only review everything that's going on on that design, but then has to go and do CAD work behind you to modify it for whatever reason to go through their processes and to get it into their, their manufacturing process. I mean, th think about this for a second. We're in 2016. CAD software is so horrible and the design tools are, uh, and the, the, the production tools are so bad that every single company basically has to hire people to go and manually muck with things to get it all to work. I mean, if you think about this for a second, it's a miracle that anything gets built and actually works. <laughs> But yeah, so they, they, they almost immediately had to email me. They were complaining up a storm. I'm like, guys, 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 really, this is the bottom of a CR2032 battery. It doesn't, you know, as you can clearly see, even, in, uh, even up there on the screen or on the board here, those two, two sections are connected. It's fine. <laughs> it really, it's fine. And they're like, oh, it, was, it was kind of a mess. But, it, but when things like that happen, even on a simple design, this delays production substantially. This particular design lost more than a day over them asking me questions about it. Because 
where's the cheapest place to find labor to ask these questions and do all this manual stuff to get it into your manufacturing process? over in uh, China and in Asia and all over the place, which means that by the time they've emailed me, I'm asleep. And by the time I wake up in the morning, deal with everything and get an email back to them, they're asleep. So I've now lost more than a day in just answering a simple question of, no, really, it's okay, just make it. Which, unfortunately, um, you know, and I've talked about, you know, timelines and all that kind of stuff. There's one other thing that sometimes goes and plays against your timelines when you're really trying to get things done quickly, which unfortunately I was trying to do with that to meet a deadline. A tsunami hit. <laughs> a tsunami hit Asia. And delayed production, uh, uh, not production, but shipping by an additional day, which um, pushed the entire production of everything out to instead of showing up on Friday, which it would have been on time, to showing up on Monday, two days late. So, when, we, when you start thinking about stuff that's going on in the physical world, as opposed to everything we're, we're used to dealing with and we're, we're really comfortable with here in the digital world, things are friggin' hard. And, and quite literally, almost everything is uh, fighting against you. The tools, the processes, you know, just getting stuff made. You know, I, I've had problems where um, from the design tools, you export everything into the, this magical Gerber common format, which is really a really shitty format. Um, and you send it off, and then they can't open it for some reason. And you're like, but, but it's in a zip file. Oh, well, we have a different zip program than you, and so we can't open your zip file. Again, this is 2016. If you want to, and actually, I'm going to, I'm going to go out on a limb here. If you want to see a, comp, a, a, a company that's really get, got their shit together really, really well, take a look at Osh Park. And Drew's going to make fun of me for plugging these guys uh, in Europe. But they're uh, um, a board manufacturer based out of uh, Portland, Oregon. Um, and they accept raw, uh, 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 native file formats from KeyCAD and uh, EagleCAD. So KeyCAD's uh, an open source uh, software, and Eagle is a, depending on whether you can fit into the hobbyist arena uh, or not, is a relatively inexpensive uh, design tool. But they, they can take those files directly and generate uh, a lot of their own manufacturing processes automatically from that, as opposed to having to do this intermediate uh, file format. So not that that's really going to help you guys a whole lot over here in Europe, because shipping's going to be ridiculously expensive, but. So, I've kind of spent a little bit of time complaining about how horrible design tools are and how hard it actually is to get something built, even really, really simple things. So I'm gonna concede hardware is actually hard. And in fact, if you think about this, how many people have done device drivers in this room? Anybody? Okay, a couple people. So, I'm going to ask the, 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 the people who have done device drivers, how often is the hardware right? He's, he's, so, for those of you uh, uh, watching at home, he's laughing. He's, he's just laughing and putting his head down. Hardware is almost always wrong. <laughs> because, as I've shown you, kind of going through even just getting simple PCBs, not even ASICs or chips actually out the door, PCBs are hard. Getting an ASIC is even harder. And by the time you've shipped everything off to get it made, either a, 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 a manufacturing problem could short something out wrong, uh, the, the, the manual people who have to deal with you know, inputting all of this stuff into the, uh, the manufacturing computers could get it wrong, something comes back flipped or broken or a whole slew of other possibilities. At which point, you as the software people all have to figure out how to work around the problem, if that's even possible. And that's sometimes all there is to it. So, since I was asking some questions about Kickstarter and uh, Indiegogo and crowdfunding things, let's talk about some much more interesting things that have failed, or are failing, um, than uh, me building a little 3-inch PCB that has an LED on it. So the Sega's V phone, um, I'm not sure anybody over here has actually heard of it, but it's a, a, an interesting phone uh, that's actually now been in, or, uh, that is supposedly 
been in design and going to manufacturing for two years. This is a, um, a fa it's actually a fascinating phone because even, even despite the fact that it was announced two years ago, they started taking money for it that, um, and everything, the phone specs are actually still quite competitive. So this should give you an idea of how far ahead of its uh, expected time it was two years ago. And they've only just, in the last couple of weeks, made it to the point where they have a production enough PCB and design that they're going through FCC testing in the United States. And for an intentional radiator, you know, going through FCC is actually a really complicated process and it's really, really kind of a pain in the ass. But some of the things that they've actually had problems with is, you know, when they've gone to manufacturers uh, in various places, they've had screw-ups. They've had um, uh, companies actually uh, get halfway through production of a PCB and it comes back completely failed. Um, and a whole slew of just general problems that you would never expect to see. Because, you know, we, we all expect that when you want a chunk of hardware, you go to Shenzhen, you tell them what you want, and a magical thing just spits out. Well, apparently, that's not actually the way this works. What happens is you go to Shenzhen, you tell them what you want, and a thing that you didn't ask for comes out. And then you ask them again, and a slightly different thing that you didn't ask for comes out. And you get this iterative process for a little while until you finally get to the point where they actually make the thing you want. And then you tell them, don't touch it. Please make me more of those. And then they touch it and make you more of those. So uh, the Sega uh, uh, phone um, is an, uh, a specific ca uh, case study in mostly how trying to outsource your, uh, your, some of your design and a lot of your manufacturing actually can work against you. Unless you're a, you're a big established player that can actually go through and babysit the process a lot, uh, a lot more. And this is a product that you guys might have actually seen over here. Has anybody actually played with a micro view here? Anybody? Okay, well, this is what I get for being an American. <laughs> American in the wrong country. Um, this is a product that actually came out of, I can't remember if it's Adafruit or SparkFun, um, but it's a, a small Arduino-based device that has a, a small OLED uh, screen on it. Um, and they've uh, put it into a, a relatively nice little form factor. They um, did a really successful Kickstarter. I think these things were only like 10 bucks, five or 10 bucks with the screen attached to them in, in the case. And they made them up and they shipped them out. and. They, Everything was going great. The software all worked. Um, their manufacturing yields were fantastic, and they get these things into the boxes, and they ship them. And as soon as people got them and opened them up, they weren't working. And everybody's freaking out about what the heck happened. And it turns out, before they put that plastic case onto it, they were supposed to flash the bootloader. And they didn't. Manufacturing problem where somebody skipped a step that they didn't think they needed to do, at the manufacturing house, and I think a, 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 a thousand of these things went out, basically bricked out of the box. And to, um, to the manufacturer's credit, they actually said, okay, look, we're not gonna make you ship these back, it's kind of ridiculous. Here's how you can flash the bootloader, but you will destroy the plastic casing getting to the pins to do this. And we're just going to manufacture an extra however many they, they had botched and ship them out. So, relatively, you know, it's a solid success story, and uh, I think the devices are still available. You might be able to get them over here now. Um, if, you, if you haven't played with one, I would actually recommend it. They're really quite cool. Xano. So everybody, you know, so one of the things that comes up on Kickstarter all the time is everybody wants to build a bloody quadcopter. I don't know why, because the only thing that quadcopters do is um, crash and break. And I say this as somebody who owns four of them. And I think three of them are broken. <laughs> um, but uh, Xano actually, uh, when they came out on the Kickstarter, they had a demo. They, they, they talked a really great talk about how this little quad copper would be able to follow you around. And as you can see, it's got this giant um, LED matrix on it. I can't remember if it was like going to be able to point arrows or whether it was going to just be able to flash so that it could take better pictures of you. And, whole slew of promises. And of course, everybody bought into the promise because it's Kickstarter. 
they had a really great video, and they had, um, by the time anybody was really looking at it, a lot of money that uh, had been thrown at them. And so more money got piled onto the existing money, and they uh, attempted to go and build these things. And I think in the end, they only got, you know, out of you know, thousands and thousands of people who backed them, I think only about 500 of these got built. <laughs> Which, um, for those of you on camera, there was a lot of scoffing. And the 500 that got built and actually shipped out to people failed every single thing that this was supposed to do, including flying. They, they, they had unfortunately, you know, come up with a really, really great concept. And this is something that happens on Kickstarter a lot. Because, you know, there are a lot of really great concepts out there. You know, everybody wants a teeny tiny little, you know, drone that can follow them around and just take random pictures. Well, maybe not everybody. I don't. Um, but, you know, there are people who do, you know, skateboarding and snowboarding and, you know, extreme sports and whatnot. That this would actually be a really cool thing to have with you. Or, you know... Maybe even here at the conference, I could see something flying around being silly. But a concept is really hard to take from, I can think of it, to actually pulling it off. And these guys had manufacturing problems, they had design, uh, hardware design problems, and they had software design problems. So they basically uh, whiffed at every possible thing for their, their project. And as a result, they basically burned through millions of dollars of other people's money not being able to deliver anything. And this is probably one of the, I, I think this may be to date the largest failure on Kickstarter, um, just because of how many people backed it, how much money got thrown at them, and how, how, how much this entire project just cratered. Now, admittedly, they didn't at least, they, they did not just steal the money and run away, so they at least tried. Which unfortunately brings me to something I've backed. <laughs> Um, the PG printer, which uh, um, a couple of years ago promised to, to figure out how to do a 3D printer with reasonably high accuracy for under a hundred bucks. And, they, and um, up until a couple of months ago, everybody thought that they were still um, making forward progress on research and de development, and they'd gone through a couple of different ways of trying to figure out how to build a better light bulb, basically. Um, because when you're trying to get, you know, a, a 3D printer that's, you know, several thousand dollars down to a price point of a hundred dollars, you're going to have to try and figure out how to make pieces that need to be highly accurate really, really cheap. And they found out a, a bunch of um, ways to do this, and they have, they have actually gone and bought a lot of the parts to build these things. Unfortunately, as it turns out a couple of months ago, one of the founders of the company and the Kickstarter embezzled something like three quarters of a million dollars out of the project and built a house. <laughs> so ignoring all of the technical things that they, they, they have clearly made it past because they, they, they're literally ready to go to production. They just now don't have the money to actually buy all of the parts and all of the, um, the final design work that needs to be done for uh, manufacturing which is, you know, uh, basically non-reoccurring engineering fees for building, you know, injection molds and, you know, laying out PCBs and, you know, making the few custom parts that you need for your specific design. They don't have the money to buy, you know, go and buy the parts and all of this, and now there's a giant set of lawsuits and Canadian legal involved. And it... So, yeah. The, you know, and these are just a couple of examples of things that um, I know of existing out in the real world of things that have just epically failed. You know, some of them for technical reasons, some of them for non-technical reasons. And a lot of what uh, makes hardware really, really hard is not the technical problems. I mean, I can sit here and gripe about CAD software for an hour if I really wanted to. I, I can pull up Eagle, actually. <laughs> No, I'm not going to pull up Eagle and show you how horrible it is. Um, you know, but the technical problems are all solvable. I mean, we're all smart people. We all deal with software. We all deal with, I mean, I mean, how many people in here program in C? Okay, you know, enough people. I mean, it, it gives you, you know, basically raw access to the system and enough rope to, to hang you and three of your friends. <laughs> 
But we can get around that. We've worked around that. You know, we've made higher level languages like Ruby and Python and you know, C++ even, you could argue, um, that make you know, the, these really hard edges much easier to deal with. So we, from a technical perspective, we can solve all the problems. All of the problems in hardware almost exclusively are not technical problems. They're all problems with just how, how the entire process works. So I'm kind of here trying to explain to a bunch of software people just how horrible it is to make hardware, how complicated it can be, and how time-consuming. Um, you know, I mean, one other example, the Minnow board, you know, the, uh, the, the project I work on, it can take, you know, even small revs of the board, you know, we're, we're, we'll swap a part on the board, can take eight months to get through before, you know, from when we've decided, you know, we're going to start something to when it actually comes out. Um, if you take a look, ADI Engineering, who's uh, doing a lot of the manufacturing for the middle board right now, uh, just announced at IDF, uh, Intel Developer Forum back in the, uh, the States, a new version of the middle board um, that has two Ethernets on it. That's been in development for many months, and it's not going to be on sale for several more. And, and they're announcing things right now, so yes. So I'm kind of hoping, since I'm, there aren't a whole lot of you in here, that you guys have questions. And I kind of ran through my slides a little bit on the fast side to kind of give you guys some time back if you want. Or I can sit here and I can answer any question you want about how hardware is actually built. Because I build hardware and I'm a software guy. Bueller? How many of you, okay, I'm gonna, ask, I'm gonna ask a question then. How many of you have actually made your own hardware? How many of you have made a PCB and actually soldered it together? Anybody, okay, so two. So you're a hard, no, you're a hardware guy and you didn't admit it then. <laughs> ah, okay. Yeah, electrical engineering is close enough to being a hardware guy. <laughs> Anybody, nobody, uh, other than these two, nobody's made a PCB? How many of you uh, have ever used a soldering iron? Okay, those of you who did not raise your hands, find your local maker space, go and ask them for a solder, you know, learn to solder kit, and honestly, go and learn to solder. And, I, and I'm not being facetious about this. It's one of the, the most liberating things you can do is realizing that you can actually fix uh, computers. I mean, I've, I've known too many people in my life who I, I, I've gone and said, oh, well, you know, just open up your computer and add a new graphics card. And they literally tell me they are scared to open their computer. And these are people who have master's degrees in computer science. And, I, and, and it boggles my mind to no end that these are people who are supposed to understand the system, at least at some level, and don't even understand the architecture or their hardware that they're actually working on enough to know that taking this, the case off of your computer will not magically let all of the magic smoke out. It, it might let some of it out if you do something really stupid, you know, like, oh, that screw you lost, you know, 10 minutes ago in the, bottom, in the case somewhere, it wasn't important anyway. It's just shorted between, you know, 12 volt and 5 volt on the motherboard, which that will let the magic smoke out a lot. Um, <laughs> um, actually, I can tell you a really funny story about letting magic smoke out. <laughs> so uh, a number of years ago, I was working for a company called uh, Orion Microsystems. They made uh, cluster computers. So 12 uh, computers on a single PCB, the PCB was this big, and 48 layers. <laughs> um, the, the company that actually made the PCB at the time, um, after they had done a few uh, produ uh, production runs, uh, specifically told us, one, they would continue making this board only for us, two, they would never make a board that big again, and three, they would never make a board with that many layers again. Pain in the ass to manufacture, because think about this. If it's a 48-layer board, they have to ma manufacture a, uh, two layers at a time. They've got to make 24 layers and then glue them all together. And they have to do this with blind and buried vias, which I've already discussed briefly. So there are so many things that can go wrong on a board of this, this size and this scale that when failure conditions happen, they get really interesting. 
And uh, in one specific prototype, um, an air gap ended up between a ground plane and a power plane on the board, which most of the time is not a big, for most boards is not a huge deal. However, on this board, since it was so big and there was so much uh, electrical current moving through it, the small pocket of air actually superheated. And, it, and it's like in the middle of this giant, I mean, seriously, the board's like this big. Um, I've got two of them that I hang on my wall uh, <laughs> because I think they're pretty. Um, uh, and as that superheated, um, it actually got so hot that it exploded. And on a PCB, the path of least resistance is not out through the top and the bottom. It's out through the edges because that's where it's been glued. So as we've got like, you know, all this power, because this is like 10 years ago, so this is you know, a lot of actual power running through the board, um, we, got, we got a 10-foot fl uh, uh, flame out the edge of a board. So it, when somebody says they let the magic smoke out, we really let the magic smoke out. <laughs> And, and, and this was a board that we had been using for testing for weeks. And it just happened at that point, it was done with the universe and it was going to explode. Needless to say, we threw that board away. But, um, and I, I, it, there, there's, I'm trying to think if there's any other, wack, I mean, there's, there's wacky stories all over the place. If you've ever worked, you know, on a low-level systems project or for a company that builds hardware, just the stories of things that come out. I've seen PCBs done by cheap Chinese companies where uh, a via, you typically have a, a, a plate that's got a hole on it and then a, a drill hole uh, that goes through the center, roughly through the center of it that gets filled. Well, we've seen that hole get exposed and the drill hole be over here. Needless to say, that was a dead board. It's, we've seen, you know, even just on a pick and place machine, you would think that these are devices that are designed to build, you know, thousands of things exactly the same way every single time. Well, how many people have a 3D printer? Anybody? Okay, a couple of people. How accurate is your 3D printer? <laughs> Not, I, I mean, how often do you have to calibrate it? Might be a better question. Not, okay, that's a, okay, you're right. The, the Ultimakers actually keep their calibration pretty well. If you hand build a, a 3D printer, my apologies, you will do nothing but calibrate it for the rest of your life. At least that's what I've seen on most of the hand built ones. Um, now think about that on a device that needs to place something to within um, uh, microns of precision. It's going to fail all the friggin' time. And uh, um, was doing a build even recently and just watching the pick and place machine and every so often it would throw a component across the room. You know, it, it, would, it would pick up the piece, it would go to put it into place and it would let it go a little too early and the part would fly over into the corner. And this, and this is a reputable manufacturing uh, uh, location, and this is the normal things that happen. I mean, how many, how many of us would expect software that just randomly decides to throw bits into a corner? Acceptable. <laughs> oh, you didn't need those three least significant bits. That's, you know, it's good enough. <laughs> but, does, eh, eh, come on, you guys have to have some questions. We're all software people. This is hardware. This is the black magic of the, the to, to us. <laughs> yep. Okay. Uh, do uh, um, so for the audience at home. Do I think there are any warning signs uh, to look for on a project that I think? Um, one of the things that, that I would suggest really paying attention to is who's behind the Kickstarter. If it's a big company like Adafruit or SparkFun or you know, somebody who's got a reputation already in, in an industry, they're going to deliver because they're, they're basically betting their own um, reputation on the line with the, the, the product itself. Um, 
so I'd almost have no, I, I, you know, Spark Fun or Adafruit or Seed Studio or any of the, you know, any company that I've, I've actually heard of and that I actually buy other things from, I would back them in a heartbeat. Just, you know, particularly if I wanted the thing. Um, if for no other reason than I, I'm, I know they've got the capabilities of doing it. Uh, case in, or although case in point, the exact opposite. I bought a 3D, or I backed a, a 3D printer from a, a company called Form Labs, and it was a complete crapshoot. A bunch of you know MIT students who were building something, um, and they had a lot of really good things to say about what they were trying to do, but none of them had actually ever gone and built something and made a, made a full product out of it and gotten it out the door because you know they were students and they wanted uh, at MIT. Now, the only thing that I think on that particular Kickstarter that really sold it, that they weren't going to just take my money and run away, was the team they had assembled and how they were talking about what they were going to do. That being said, you know, there, there are examples, even in, in what I was showing, you know, the, the, the PG printer, the, the drone, you know, these are things that were backed by a lot of people. And so there was a lot of people looking at their videos and their, you know, their, their documentation and whatnot. And, you know, we all got, you know, the, the wool pulled over our eyes or something happened or, or these kinds of things. And at the end of the day, what I can say about Kickstarter is don't back anything uh, or, or don't spend any of the money on Kickstarter or Indiegogo or whatever the, the crowdfunding thing unless you're okay with never seeing that money again. It really, I mean, I, I want to say that, um, you know, that, that everything's going to be, you know, magical. And if you look for this one thing, it, it's not just one thing. It's basically put your money into, into a hole and hope that something magical pops back out. Um, because there, there's, it's, yeah, it just is. But I, I don't think any of us are going to stop backing these things because every so often something comes along, uh, along and you go, that's friggin' cool, I want that to exist. And that's kind of the same way with open source software. You know, we all go, you know, this is a cool idea. This is something I need. Uh, I'm going to go scratch it. Well, that's all Kickstarter is, is kind of a, a, a way for people who want to, you know, share the thing that they're building with other people. Because I can build hardware till I'm blue in the face, but if um, you want a copy of it, it, you know, and you want a copy of it, it stops making sense for me to be doing it for myself and actually go and start and try and do a Kickstarter, so... Yep. The the which one? Oh, the Jola tablet. Yes. I, do I really have to get? <laughs> yeah. The, the the Jola tablet is is another one of those big. You know, they they, they had ev everything going for them, and they still basically failed. And I I don't remember exactly what all happened with it. I know the broad strokes off the top of my head. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's one of the, those situations, again, if you're going to back something, just be prepared that that thing will never exist and you've just wasted a bunch of money. I, I mean, people like to think of Kickstarter as like a store or a, or a pre-order kind of a thing, and no, really what you're doing is you're, you're giving these people money in the hopes that they will actually be able to succeed at the thing, and you'll get this magical other thing out at the end. And it's it's more like you're an angel investor than you know a silent angel investor than anything. So. Yes, I do actually have some experience with some non-Asian manufacturers, and generally speaking, they're a little they're nicer to work with if for no other reason you know that then the time zone differences are not so extreme. So when they have problems, they can. Um, the turnaround time is substantially less. It's not like, you know, they run into a problem and then by the time it's resolved, it's 24 to 48 hours later. Um, and generally speaking, you know, the, the stuff that's coming out of them is just, you know, is either as good a quality, if not better. Usually the thing that really makes them um, uh, less attractive is that they're usually substantially more expensive. And that's including shipping. I mean, the, the, I just put a, a, an order in for a small soldering kit that's going to a Maker Faire um, next weekend, actually. Uh, and 
it was, it's actually cheaper for me to go and get the, the PCBs manufactured um, in Shenzhen and shipped to the United States in time than to try and get somebody in the United States to make them in time. And it sucks. I would much rather the, you know, deal with somebody in the US, but when it's a tenth the cost to get them manufactured the other way around, and, th and there, are different there are better places to go and look for PCBs. So if anybody ever wants to go and start actually building your own stuff, take a look at KeyCAD, take a look at EagleCAD. Um, and there's a great place to go and get um, uh, pri you know, just hand-wavy pricing numbers for uh, PCBs. It's called PCB Shopper. Um, they're actually really good about, you know, you, 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 you fill in this giant form, and it's, it's like seriously this long, and it's got questions that you'll probably never understand unless you go and Google half of the, the, the questions. Usually leaving the defaults is fine. Usually. <laughs> um, and, and they'll go and they'll query a lot of different manufacturers uh, for PCBs. And I've yet to have any problems with the, uh, with the manufacturers that they have suggested. You know, your mileage will vary, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm not trying to advocate anybody. I'm just saying they're an interesting place to go and look, and they've got a, it, it's easier than trying to find a random PCB shop on your own. So, anyone else? <laughs> uh, since you said that the scaling of software is so horrible, do you know any projects to make it better? KeyCat. <laughs> so, um, the, the question is, is, do I know of any projects that are there trying to make uh, CAD software better? The best one I know of right now is KeyCAD, which is an open source uh, CAD design uh, chunk of software. And in fact, it's getting a lot of really neat features because CERN um, is using KeyCAD for all of their designs. So they, they actually just pushed in, um, uh, there's this kind of joke in the, the CAD world that there's never trust the auto router, which is this chunk of software that tries to route all of the traces for you. It usually does it wrong, almost always does it wrong. Um, well, they just pushed patches into KeyCAD, I want to say about a year ago uh, now, that did differential pair routing uh, to match uh, lengths and impedances which this is huge in a chunk of open source software because this is you know, sometimes the holy grail of how expensive some CAD software gets. Um, so there's huge strides being made in the open source software world for this. And if you, I mean, if you want to go and spend some time, uh, I, KeyCAD's the way I would go. So, and you had a question. Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 So, uh, so we'll put some things into perspective. How much do people think CAD software, like the, the high end CAD software, costs? How many people think it's a uh, 500 bucks? A thousand? Ten thousand? Okay, more hands. You're in the right ballpark. It's usually ten thousand dollars and up. So there's a lot of money per seat um, that's invested in really good CAD software. And for the most part, you know, the, the kind of people who are going to be in this room, you don't need that level of CAD software by far. I mean, that's the kind of stuff that you're making server motherboards with. Or you know, laying out you know, act, uh, well, you don't lay out chips that way, but it's the kind of idea of you know something's ridiculously complex. That 48 layer board, you don't do an Eagle CAD. I'm not even sure Eagle CAD has enough uh, software behind it to even handle that. Um, so yes, there, there, there's a lot of money in just the status quo. Um, but things like KeyCAD are actually, you know, since people want to use open source tools to make open source, you know, to make open source designs, you know, people are pushing all of the things that are in these higher end pieces of software back into things like KeyCAD. Now, KeyCAD suffers from some really interesting problems that are exactly the same problems that every other GUI piece of uh, um, software in the open source world suffers from, and it's really horrible UI. I, I, you know, and I, I want to love you, uh, the UI in a lot of open source software, but it's all horrible because we're not UI people. We're really not. And so to, there, are, there are 
process flows inside of KiCad where you end up actually using four different programs that all have to communicate in weird one-way paths to make it all to make everything work. Now you end up with a really nice board at the end, but some of the leaps between various steps in the program are a little less intuitive than some of the other chunks of software that are out there. EagleCAD makes uh, uh, the flow actually fairly simple and fairly straightforward. So if you're trying to learn something, EagleCAD's not a bad way to go if you're willing to put up with the licensing. Um, if you really want to stay you know, true to all of the open source hardware and software stuff, KiCad's probably your best bet. But yes, people are, people are actually investing a fair amount of time and effort into things like KiCad right now to, to fix the various perceived issues that are there. I mean, people are scratching their, their specific itches right now. And if you look back at other big chunks of software like Blender and whatnot that had really horrible UI issues, at some point, somebody gets a really solid itch to go and fix the UI problems. And I think we're probably going to start getting close to somebody getting really annoyed and wanting to go fix those. So. Many. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, d I don't know how long it's going to take for CAD software to get better. Now, if the, the, the barrier to entry is we're, we're used to like UIs and systems that are two decades old, the barrier to entry is really, really low. <laughs> you don't have to be that much better to, to, to kind of displace uh, some of this. But yeah, so I'm, I, I'm actually actively, um, I'm going to start flipping all of my design work over to KiCad just to force myself to learn it, and I'm pretty sure I'm going to end up with an itch somewhere that's going to need to be fixed, so. <laughs> and my wife actually wants to do stuff too, so she's probably gonna end up with an itch too, so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's early 80s. Yes. So to summarize that for the camera, it's basically a bunch of people who made some backend software in the early 80s or somewhere a long time ago, like GCC, decided that at some point they needed a UI. So the GCC developers made a UI for GCC, is kind of that, <laughs> which I would, I can't even imagine what a UI to GCC would look like. Actually, I'm probably gonna have nightmares about that now, so. So um, the question is, is can I kind of do a quick comparison and con uh, con contrast against KiCad and Eagle? Um, the simplest, uh, the simplest uh, comparison is KiCad doesn't uh, force you into a size and layer restriction, whereas Eagle obviously does, uh, just because of licensing. The other big things you're going to see coming from Eagle going to KiCad, um, you know, when you design your own parts, because uh, of course, Every part in the universe does not have a magical uh, part in every CAD software, which means you then have to go and design your own parts for everything. And each manufacturing, or each design house has this giant library of parts that they've had to go and custom make that's almost their bread and butter, honestly. Um, the, the way you design that in KiCad is um, substantially, substantially more obnoxious to, uh, to do. It's not quite as streamlined as what you would expect out of Eagle. I don't know, I, I assume you've had to do your own parts at some point. Um, at least in Eagle, it's not too weird. In KiCad, it's a little cumbersome. Um, it's doable, but it's just, it's how you do it doesn't mesh with the way you would probably think about it as well. 
Um, and that's really the, the, the pieces in KiCad. It's just you end up with separate programs to do very separate things. They actually follow the Unix model really, really well. It's, except that when you're doing this from a UI perspective, the jumps between uh, the separate programs can be a little bit, uh, it's more jarring than you'd expect. Yes, KiCad's actually fairly well documented. Um, and there's a lot of tutorials and whatnot out there. I mean, there's just as many tutorials for KiCad as there is for Eagle. So, I mean, if you, you know, kind of muddled your way through Eagle, um, KiCad won't be that different. And the upside is, is once you know one chunk of uh, CAD software, you know roughly what's possible. So you, you, you'll know, oh, I should be able to do this. You know, where do I go and look and find this? And you know, might have to Google for it a little bit, but you'll be okay. So. Any other questions? Comments, concerns? Oh. What do you about FPGAs? So FPGAs are amazing things. And um, depending on what you're doing, they, can, they may be the, the right thing to do um, your prototyping with. The downside to FPGAs is that you're basically on a path to do an ASIC or an actual IC um, as opposed to making a full-on board. So there, there's things that you can do in an FPGA that you can't do in other things, but there's stuff that you can't do in an FPGA. Like, you can't build an accelerometer inside an FPGA. At least I don't think you can. If you can, I, I'm happy to uh, get corrected. But, you know, th these are kinds of, you know, the, the kinds of things where you would um, put these on a board or something are, are slightly different than what you would use for an FPGA. Now, if you want to, you know, prototype a custom uh, CPU architecture, FPGAs are clearly the way to go because you don't have to go and, you know, spend millions of dollars setting things up to go and, you know, make your own ASIC and then find out that you've shorted 12 of the layers out of however many layers are on your, your, um, on your chip and then have to go spend a couple more million dollars, you know, fixing that mistake. Um, and I, and I know a, a lot of different companies that have done that. I mean, we, um, when I was at Orion Multisystems, some of the things we were doing, we were actually prototyping South Bridges. Um, CPU South Bridges uh, about a decade ago in the largest FPGAs that we could get. We could still only uh, simulate a quarter of the South Bridge. Uh, uh, we were doing some really crazy shit back then. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I love FPGAs for things. It, they're the only downside if you're trying to like add an FPGA to a design you've already got, that, like an open hardware design. FPGAs are really fickle for, um, on what power they need and they're very power hungry, typically. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, the design, designing for them will be more complicated if you add them to your own design. Um, the other thing to worry about is that the um, uh, stream chains, the, uh, how you create the software that actually runs on the FPGA has a tendency to be proprietary. There's only a couple of FPGAs out right now that I think have a completely open source uh, tool chain from end to end. Um, otherwise, you know, thing, you know, almost all of the Altera and um, I can't think of the other. Comp I'm sorry. Um, no, I'm trying to think of there, there's Xilinx. Yeah, Xilinx. Thank you. Um, the Xilinx ones. Uh, those are proprietary, unfortunately. So, and I think people are trying to come in for the next talk, so I'm going to have to shut this down. Anyway, thank you very much, and I hope you guys enjoyed.